the biggest lesson I learned with Rachel was that she had free will. Rachel was a good person. She cared about her friends, but she also was very hard-headed, and if, if um, she had very strong will, very. And she, she was so independent, and Rachel was her own person from a very early age. When she was six years old, she, she had this kick where she, all she would wear was green. I had to go to the store and only green. Six years old, I had to buy all green clothes. And she wouldn't wear anything but green. And then at nine, or six, I don't remember, there was another phase like around this time where she would only wear black. So then I had to change the whole wardrobe to black. And it was just like these things about Rachel. And when she had, she would not go to Hebrew school because she did not like the teacher. And she just said, that woman, she, she was not going back, that was it. She just had this idea about this woman, she did not like her, and she was not going. And she, this was when she was young. I mean, under, she was young at that point, so just very strong-willed. Rachel was special <laughs> from, from a young age. And when she was one, we moved to a community. We lived in an intentional community, which is a community where people go who want to um, create a better world, essentially. It was called Eco Village in Ithaca. It's an intentional community where we have community meals, we have green building, an organic farm. She grew up in this community, and it affected her in many ways. Um, good and bad. And the community was about um, 150 people when we moved there uh, on 176 acres. So we had a lot of land to explore. And Rachel had some health issues from an early age, uh, from birth, really. She had some digestive issues and various health issues. And because I'm a naturopathic doctor, I took very good care of her. And I nursed her for a long time. And we could kind of, because we lived in, a in this kind of community where the people were very connected to nature, we grew our own food, um, we, um, we did green building. And this is, you know, back, she was born in 2001, so a while ago, where we, you know, had all this um, connection that, you know, became more popular later. And, um, but living in a community um, it's like having an extended family of 150 people. <laughs> and in a way, the negatives for Rachel, it, it was hard. There were some hard things that she had to live with because of um, other parents and parenting styles and, um, and children that were not very nice at times. So, you know, Rachel and I, we spent a lot of time together. And I held Rachel pretty much for the first seven months of her life. We were very connected. I nursed her for a long time, many years beyond what most people would do, and partially because she was sick, and I, and I wanted to do everything I could to help her in this life. What I would say is that people that live in that community, like any other community, what's lacking is a spiritual, a deeper, deeper meaning, and that we bring people together and we need to come together on a physical plane, but also on, on other planes. And we need to learn how to work together, but also to believe that there's something more than just us. And that was missing in that community. And, and it, it caused that people, people are people. <laughs> Everywhere you go, no matter where you go, people are people. And, uh, and and people have emotional baggage, and they bring it into community, and they bring it into relationships, and that's, you know, causes, you know, it can cause harm. And we have generational harm, and that, that's what this fentanyl crisis, to me, is about. It's generational, you know, harm that we've done to ourselves, to each other, and, and we carry it on, and it just keeps perpetuating itself. She lived there um, pretty much from the time she was one until um, 
when she was about, when, so when I went through a divorce, when she was 15, when I started the divorce process, which caused a lot of upheaval in her life. And she really did better with stability. But at that point, I, I, I needed, like, I stayed married as long as I could. <laughs> so um, my oldest was 18 and Rachel was 15. And so that was, that was when it happened. Um, but so at that point, she still, she lived part-time with me at the house in the, in the community in Eco Village and then part-time with her dad and kind of went back and forth some, but mostly at the house still. And then I, and, and then still some until she was maybe... 19, where she moved in with a boyfriend who she was with for a while. He was a Cornell student, or, um, and uh, so they were living pretty close by Cornell University. The, the turning point in her life, I mean, getting, uh, us getting divorced, my husband and I getting divorced, we are quite good friends now, um, Bill and I. And but us getting divorced caused a, a lot of upheaval for Rachel. I mean, she had a wonderful, in a way, a wonderful childhood. I mean, living in that community, being in nature, growing up with organic produce. I mean, we grew food. She had a lot of, you know, great things, experiences in her life. Um, I feel like, you know, I did what I could for Rachel. And I, I, she, she was into pottery. She, you know, pottery. She played basketball. She, she did a little theater. She was in the, a Christmas carol. So she, she did various things and had a lot of, you know, we went, we went on a lot of vacations. We would go to Seattle every year, um, spend time at Lake Chelan up in Seattle because we left Seattle. She was born in Seattle. She was born at home in Seattle. Home birth. Both my girls were born home birth. And so, th so she, you know, we went to Seattle and then we, we went to Ithaca. But, you know, in, and even we went back every year. She had a great grandparents. She had, she had a lot of great things in her life. She had a lot of support, a lot. And a lot of stability. And so the divorce was the thing that created instability. So Rachel at nine was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and celiac disease. And, um, but she never had pain and we never put her on medication and she was never vaccinated her whole life until COVID. So basically she was on no medications. I'm, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So I gave her natural remedies and she was on no medication. But naturopathic doctors, what we do is try and find the underlying causes of disease and really helping people to address the underlying causes and then helping the whole body get healthy instead of just helping a system. Like, like you have rheumatoid arthritis. It's a great example. Now, Rachel had celiac disease, which was part of the reason she got rheumatoid arthritis. And you know, if she cut out gluten and dairy, which she was also allergic to, then it, that would help her body. Now, she may also need other supportive things like helping with sleep. And, but we don't, use, we don't use prescriptions. We try and, you know, deal with nutrient deficiencies, looking at the diet, looking at lifestyle, doing exercise, meditation. It's a whole lifestyle program. And then COVID hit. Now, I don't know exactly when she started on medication, but I do remember that after, so she got vaccinated for COVID. It was her first vaccine. And after that, she was complaining about pain. And then she started going to rheumatologists and various doctors, and she was on multiple medications. And when she died, she had five prescription drugs in her system and fentanyl. And the interaction, I've studied this, and I've, I've spent much of my life trying to keep people off prescription medication. And it was a big commitment of mine, especially young women, 
because they would give them psychiatric medications like, you know, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, sleep medications. And she, Rachel was on all these. And I would have these conversations with Rachel. I'd say, Rachel, you got to get off these medications. And she said, Mom, my doctors know what they're doing. They're helping me. And these were conversations we would have. She would call me in the middle of the night. She'd be in pain. She'd be throwing up. She'd have all kinds of problems. And she wouldn't listen to me anymore. We were at a, a dinner at a Seder for Passover, like when she was nine. And all of a sudden, I looked at her fingers. I said, Rachel, what's with your fingers? And she said, oh, they don't bother me. And I was like, well, they were, they were pretty, you know, like, to me, it looked serious. But she said, oh, they don't bother me at all. So she never mentioned it. She never mentioned it. <laughs> and, and so then I ended up taking her to doctors. And, and they were like, well, she's got rheumatoid arthritis and celiac, but she had no symptoms. So we're not going to do anything. So just stop eating gluten and don't worry about it. <laughs> so she was fine until, until COVID. And then everything changed. And then she was on so many medications. Based on my experience with clients and based on what I've read, is that the vaccine alters the immune system for some people. And if you have a latent autoimmune condition, sometimes it gets triggered and other health conditions can get triggered. So it, it's kind of like what I've heard from doctors and what I've experienced with clients is that sometimes they'll have like a, something that's not a problem. Like it, a lot of people have like a positive ANA or they'll have a positive test, but they don't have like their symptoms aren't bad enough where they have to. When in medicine, if you like basically the medication for rheumatoid arthritis is so harsh on the system that unless you need it, you don't want to take it. So unless you're having symptoms that are progressive or, you know, so bad that it's debilitating or it's affecting your life, you don't want to take those medications because the, the negatives outweigh the positives and everything's about, you know, weighing the negatives and positives. And for her, she didn't need medication before then. So something happened. I, I mean, I can't say what happened because I don't, I didn't even see the medical records. I mean, she was over 18 and, you know, she had her, she had free will. So she went to her doctors and I had no say. You know, right. <clears throat> I won't get into the politics of what's happening with medicine and, and informed consent and the fact that your child can go to a doctor in some states and basically ask for something and get it. But she was over 18 at that point. I think the biggest problem that, that with Rachel's situation was the number of medications she's on, that she was on way too many medications. And instead of saying, what can I do to help myself get better? She was relying on her doctors giving her prescriptions. And basically, she was made into a drug addict, a prescription drug addict. And I don't like that. And I think it happens too commonly because people don't realize they have an alternative. She knew she had an alternative. She just, I was her mother, so she didn't want to listen to me. You know, Rachel had celiac, which means she shouldn't eat gluten. She also had a dairy allergy, and she would eat gluten and dairy. And I would say, Rachel, you got to stop eating these things. But again, you know, I could say to her, Rachel, she knew what to do for herself. She knew. And, you know, the day she died, it's a complicated—it it was like, it just, to me, it just felt like it was her—she <sighs> put herself in a situation that she knew wasn't a good situation. Her boyfriend at the time, they were together for a couple of years, and— he was involved in, she said, drinking too much. And I, I don't know what he was involved with. There were some questions about this whole situation um, as to whether what was really happening, like if, it was, if, 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 if there was prescriptions involved, because there was some talk about prescriptions and then 
drinking and um but he would she would be very worried about him and she used to say to me like we uh, something happened and like make sure make sure he has his naloxone his you know you know she was all worried about him overdosing or something so she was always worried about everybody else so she, she was very she was a caretaker and like her mother <laughs> And so she always worried about everybody um, and her friends and her boyfriends. And she just didn't take very good care of herself sometimes, although she would say she did. Um, and so what happened was she went to Bali with her sister. For, so her sister went to Bali for a month, Indonesia. And, um, and Rachel went was going to go to Bali as well. So Rachel met her sister in Bali for two weeks and they had a great time together, like amazing. And Sarah's got a bunch of pictures that she'll send me from that trip because they were just so happy and they went, you know, different places and in Bali and lived in these huts and it was just very cool. And she went all by herself like flew to Bali by herself, which is amazing. She's 21 years old. And, um, and that was October. And she came back. And October 31st, she had a car accident. And uh, at the car accident, I, I went, she was in New Jersey at her boyfriend's house and had a car accident October 31st. So Todd and I, my husband and I, went to get her. We went to pick up her car and to pick her up, and the car supposedly wasn't drivable, so we left the car in New Jersey. We picked up Rachel, drove her back to our house in Connecticut. Uh, she stayed there one night, and then I drove her to her dad in, in Roscoe, New York, where we met halfway. That was between halfway between Ithaca and where I was living in Connecticut. We drove Rachel. I said goodbye to her. That was the last time I saw her. Rachel went back to Ithaca with her dad. I thought she was going to stay at her dad's house. And I thought, okay, Rachel's safer in New York, in Ithaca, than she would be in Connecticut because she didn't like Connecticut. And she ended up going out that one night she stayed in Connecticut. She went to a place where my husband said, don't go there. But she went there. And that was the one night she was in Connecticut. She went back to New York. The next thing I know, I get a call. I, I, I was texting her some, you know, I love you. You know, we, 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 are, we were very communicative. We had a great relationship. She had gone to a friend's house. She left that friend's house, drove five hours to Connecticut. Some guy she met in Connecticut said to her, he had a car accident and he needed help. She drove five hours back to Connecticut, to this guy's house. And that's where she died, at his house, at his mother's house, in his mother's house. And the mother was there and the boy was there. That's all I know. And she had told her friend in New York, that where she was before she went to Connecticut, she said, oh, I don't think I should go. I, don't, I, I think it might not be a good idea. And then she did, and she didn't tell us. I thought she was at her dad's house. I, I had no idea. I don't know where she met this guy. I didn't know anything about him, never heard his name. Her friends hadn't heard of him. And she died there. In this, in, in the, the boy got up in the middle of the night to help his mother, she, ha she was sick, the mother was sick. He got up in the middle of the night to give her a hot water bottle, got back to bed, Rachel was alive, and then in the morning, Sunday morning, she was dead. They didn't drink, Rachel didn't drink. She didn't do street drugs. There was, the, the police report said something about, he, he said there was something in the house, and he said 
fentanyl, he were, his words were, now we have the tox report that shows that she had five prescription medication and fentanyl in her system, and that was it. No street drugs except fentanyl. And the policeman said, fentanyl is something else. They call it different names, but it was fentanyl. That's all. That's all I know. It must have been an interaction with the medication or something. I mean, the, the prescriptions, they could have interacted with the fentanyl. How did she end up with fentanyl? I, I don't know. Was, it, was she deceived? Was it a, did she take a Xanax and it had fentanyl in it? I mean, I have no idea. We don't know. They don't know because they don't know what was, yeah. I mean, all they know, the, the, they, get, they gave me a list of the prescriptions and fentanyl. So we don't know how she got it. I just have to give it up to a higher power, God, because I, the whole thing, it, it's like she had this wonderful trip with her sister she had just broken up with her boyfriend. That's why she left uh, New Jersey. And, but they still loved each other. And it was, I mean, they, but she just, I don't know. I, I don't know. It, it was like she was in limbo uh, for, for this very short period of time. The car accident, the leaving New Jersey, the coming to Connecticut, going back to New York, back to Connecticut. It's it, it just all bizarre to me. I mean, it's like, there was no way to intervene. I mean, all I can say, like, you know, I, I try and not put my own, like, situation, my thoughts about the polypharmacy and the, you know, it's like, why was she on all these medications? Did she need them all? She was on some pretty strong medication. And she was young, you know? Kids do stupid things, you know? And, and if, you know, sometimes, and, and before she died, she had gone to New Jersey to try and get some more medication. So I don't know if she was addicted to the medication, um, if, you know, it was the combination of the medication, if somebody gave her, like she ran out of something and somebody gave her a Xanax or something that had fentanyl. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Um, she would vape. Was there something in the vape? I mean, that's another possibility. You know, so I don't know. The fact that the fentanyl is, you know, it's, it's too per pervasive. Like, you should be able to make a stupid mistake, like smoke some pot or, or you know, take a, 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 a Xanax from your friend. You know, you used to be able to do that. Now you die. And, and our children should be protected at some level from this. Now the, the, you, can't, you can't make a mistake. There's no room for mistake. And, you know, they're young. These, these kids who are dying, they're young. They're too young. I'm a big, uh, like, go to estate sales, and, you're, and I saw this. And it, it's, you know what's amazing? See, to me, this is, this is very natural. It was a piece of stone or soapstone, I think it's soapstone, and, and somebody took it and created this heart. And, and through the heart is a line on both sides, which would be like a broken heart. But it's solid. So the heart, it may be broken, but it's still here. And, it, you know, I think, why am I still here? I must have something to do. And, you know, this reminds me I'm still here with the broken heart, I'm still here.